Sickness, pain, suffering, death, they're all cruel realities in our world. How can we reconcile all of this with our God who is all powerful and all good? Hi, Bruce Marciano here. Welcome to part two of our six-part series, Who is Jesus? An exploration of the life and the teachings of Jesus. In this episode, we're going to explore how Jesus related to suffering, sorrow, and loss. I'm sitting here with Jenny in the dialysis unit of a hospital. Jenny is on dialysis, and she's agreed to chat with us for a few minutes about her situation and her struggles within it. I've been a diabetic for 35 years and my kidneys have now failed due to that and so I've had to go on to a kidney machine and dialysis. I do that three days a week for five hours. Um, it's fairly draining and frustrating, um, makes you angry sometimes, um, makes you sick other times. Tell us a little bit about your struggles with fears and hopes and things like that. Yeah, some days you just don't want to be here, you don't know how long it's going to last, you don't know what's coming next, um, and all the side effects and things that happen as well um, all bring frustrations and anger. Obviously I have a different perspective on death and mortality than a lot of people. Can you help us understand that a little bit? Um, death is scary. Um, I. I don't know how I feel about death some days. Other days I'm at peace with it. Um, and other days I can't understand it. I don't know what's going to happen. No one knows what's going to happen when you die. So I guess it's an unknown. And when you don't know about something, it's scary. Um, but I do have peace in knowing that God loves me. And I know there's a future ahead. Um, we don't know how long that's going to be. We don't know when it's going to happen but I have that positiveness to hold on to, and that's all you've got to hold on to some days. I've had to learn to regard cancer as a wake-up call to appreciate life, life's best things right here and now. None of us have a guarantee of tomorrow at all. And um, I'm finding each day is a bonus, a gift to be explored. Emotionally, um, one still rages and asks questions why. But there's that calming influence that comes from have a deep faith in God and, and Him holding me more than me holding up to Him, I would say. I really did find it an absolutely shocking diagnosis. It came right out of the blue. There's nothing in my family to warrant this and um, I'd probably been doing all the right things as far as I know. So it really came as a big shock and, and my emotions went up and down on a roller coaster. Anger, denial, um, rage, all kinds of feelings that go through and despair, hopelessness and then hope again and, and uncertainty. I think the uncertainty was the worst part for me. I like to know what's happening in the future. I live by lists and, and, and uh, planning, and, and this was really very devastating indeed. Well, none of us is immortal, and sometimes we, we live, the, live as if we are going to live forever. But um, I've realized that life is short. We're all going to die sometime. Um, being brought face to face with one's mortality is, is quite a shock. And um, I find Emotionally, I just need to hold on. Um, death, for me, I've, I've sort of worked through it in my mind. Um, it's not the same as being there and doing it, but um, I have hope beyond the grave because Jesus went there and came back again. And this, this has given me tremendous peace in my mind and assurance that trusting Him and believing in Him, I have eternal life. And, and that is a most glowing thought in the face of me. Okay, Our modern-day healers bring us hope in times of despair. 
dedicated doctors, nurses, scientists, medical researchers, and whole teams of medical support staff commit their lives to caring for those who are injured or unwell. While there are still many diseases or illnesses they cannot cure, many people do get a second chance at life thanks to the skilled medical people who treat them. Their care and compassion comes from the heart and their power to heal comes from modern medical technology. But imagine if a man came into a place like this and he began healing people with a power that was greater than any medicine. <laughs> In Jesus' time, the Jewish people living under Roman rule were no strangers to suffering. Flogging, stonings, crucifixion, and other barbaric punishments were common practice. And without modern medicine, many suffered and were crippled by diseases and injuries that they had no hope of recovering from. So imagine the impact Jesus had when he came along. A man with leprosy came and knelt before him and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said. Be clean. Immediately he was cured of his leprosy. Later that day, he encountered a Roman centurion who beseeched him to cure his dying servant. Lord, my servant lies at home paralyzed and in terrible suffering. Jesus said to him, I will go and heal him. The centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve for you to come under my roof. But just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority, with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes. That one, come, and he comes. I tell my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was astonished and said to those following him, I tell you the truth, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and will take their places at the feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. For the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then Jesus said to the centurion, Go, it will be done just as you believed it would. and his servant was healed at that very hour. On numerous occasions through Matthew's story of Jesus, he gives us brief but similar descriptions of Jesus interacting with people going through times of pain and times of suffering. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. Later we hear, when they had crossed over, they landed at Gennesaret. 
And when the men of that place recognized Jesus, they sent word to all the surrounding country. People brought all their sick to him, begged him to let the sick just touch the edge of his cloak. And all who touched him were healed. Jesus healed the sick. <laughs> Jesus left there and went along the Sea of Galilee. Then he went up on a mountainside and sat down. Great crowds came to him, bringing the lame, the blind, the crippled, the mute, and many others, and laid them at his feet, and he healed them. The people were amazed when they saw the mute speaking, the crippled made well, the lame walking, and the blind seeing. And they praised the God of Israel. But it's important to realize that Jesus didn't heal people just to attract crowds or draw attention to himself or drum up financial support. No, Jesus was nothing like any of those unfortunate stereotypes that we sometimes see. In fact, Jesus quite often would heal someone and then he would tell them, don't tell anyone about it. As Jesus went on from there, two blind men followed him, calling out, have mercy on us, son of David. When he had gone indoors, the blind men came to him, and he asked them, Do you believe that I am able to do this? Yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes and said, According to your faith will it be done to you. And their sight was restored. <sighs> Jesus warned them sternly, See that no one knows about this. Reasons for human suffering have been debated across history and cultures. Over the centuries, religious teachers and novelists and dramatists and poets have all grappled with the questions of agony and loss and suffering and death. Today I stand in front of the Roman Colosseum and I cannot even imagine the kind of, kind of horrors that took place in these walls. And all of them together, all their answers range from quiet resignation all the way to open rebellion. This question goes right to the core of Judeo-Christian belief in an all-powerful, wise, and good God. How can we maintain our belief in God in the face of such intense human suffering? The big question goes like this. If God is all-powerful and absolutely good, why is there so much suffering? Surely in his power he could put an end to it, and surely in his goodness he would want to put an end to it. But as we all know, the suffering continues. So, on the surface, one is easily tempted to think, perhaps God isn't all-powerful, or perhaps he isn't absolutely good. In the face of real suffering, it's often hard to keep a faith that says God is both all-powerful and all-good. And if he is not really both, is he really a God worth believing in? After all, we know the extent of God's powers to heal is shown in this story. My daughter has just died. Come and put your hand on her and she will live.
Take heart, daughter. Your faith is healed, dear. In this story, Jesus showed that he's not only capable of healing people, but of actually bringing them back from the dead. Jesus clearly demonstrated that he's all-powerful, even more powerful than death. So if Jesus does have power over the pain, sickness, or death in our lives, how does this make us feel about him when the suffering continues? This pageant reenactment can't begin to reveal the fullness of Jesus' suffering. And every day of his life, he knew this was coming. All that to say our God understands pain. He knows suffering. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, Sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him. And he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. fell with his face to the ground and prayed. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Could you men not keep watch with me for one hour? He asked Peter. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. He 
went away a second time and prayed. But it wasn't possible. There was no other way. So Jesus' agony in the garden that night was just the beginning of his suffering. He was betrayed by a friend. He was abused and tortured. He was tried unfairly and sentenced to death. They came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. Jesus wine to drink mixed with gall but after tasting it he refused to drink it Jesus experienced the worst suffering our world could throw at him and he asked some very hard questions from the sixth hour until the ninth hour darkness came over all the land about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi! Eloi! Moments of my study! Which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In his book, Orthodoxy, G.K. Chesterton points to this cry of Jesus' My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he suggests that in all the world's religions, we can, quote, only find one divinity who ever uttered their isolation, end quote. This is a God who understands our perspective. He understands our questions. And he understands our deepest, most heart-wrenching cries. And this was the revelation I experienced personally when I was playing Jesus in the Gospel according to Matthew. In a sense, I had to taste his pain and his suffering. And even though I'd known all about the crucifixion all my life, it was a whole other thing to have to go through it, if you will. It was grueling in every way, physically, emotionally, spiritually. I'll never forget the feeling of just having those thorns on my head and, and crushing into my face and the flogging and just being knocked around and kicked by the actors playing the Roman soldier. I'll never forget hanging from that cross beam and literally counting the seconds till the director yelled cut and they could take me down. It was terrible beyond description. And it was only a drop of water in the oceans of the world compared to the reality of Jesus 2,000 years ago. <laughs> Filming those scenes that day was a life-changing experience for me in every way. After a lifetime of hearing about the crucifixion and reading the crucifixion stories, Suddenly, I was just hanging there and hanging there. And it was as if for the first time in my life, I really understood those words of Jesus. I have loved you with an everlasting love. It was as if I could hear his whisper, I did it for you. I love you. I love you. And that's really the bottom line. He did all of that. He chose all of that for love of you, the full extent of his love. In the middle of it all, he opens the door wide for eternal life. In the story of Jesus' death for us on the cross, there are two very significant things happening. Firstly, as we've talked about, we have Jesus, who was and is God, sharing in the worst of human suffering. And secondly, we have God dying for our sins, for our salvation, 
so we can join him to live forever without death, pain, sorrow, or tragedy. Jesus' power to heal and his power over death give us such great hope for our lives. Hope that will take us beyond and through any measure of human suffering and even more than that, hope beyond the human grave. It's so exciting. Well, we've explored another huge topic in this episode of Who is Jesus? And I'm happy to report that there's more to come. So thank you very much for joining us and God bless you.